Thank you, Emily. Um, and, and I also um, I want to mention that some of the frames that you were presenting there did recall for me some of the comments we had at the beginning um, of the session. You know, the, um, the idea of proof versus opinion, you know, these sort of rigid beliefs um, versus, um, you know, what counts as evidence versus what counts as opinion, and some students actually seeing them as one and the same. Um, and, and considering that more or less fixed or fluid. And as Emily mentioned too, you know, certainly our goal uh, is not to essentialize cultures here and recognize culture as a fluid, dynamic, ongoing process, you know, lifelong, um, and develop cultures, subcultures across, you know, time. But I think it's a great point of entry in terms of awareness of different perspectives, right? Begin trying to think in terms of unpacking, as I mentioned earlier, some of what happens in a classroom when there, when, there are, when there are cultural differences. And I think having these sorts of frameworks or points of entry to try to um, look past the whatever is happening in the experience and try to analyze, try to, try to think, okay, then where might this, what might be informing this and, and how can I address and help, either help support if a student's struggling or, you know, as Emily mentioned earlier, there's great richness in cultural difference in the classroom. So our opening question of um, what have been your experiences of cultural differences in teaching um, was not meant to skew negative, you know, predominantly or only, you know, in, in negative or challenging ways. There's great richness brought in by way of um, cultural difference, of course. And so here, um, though, some of the potential impacts of cultural difference, just drawing from a few research uh, re uh, studies in literature, we can find that students who feel alienated or isolated can be less likely to contact faculty or staff for support. And they might not contact faculty or support till it's too late. And that isolation can happen in terms of language, you know, students self-conscious self of their language skills, feeling like um, their written or oral skills aren't up to par, and so they're too embarrassed to want to contact anyone for help. Um, they can also feel isolated in terms of teaching style or learning style. You know, it can be really jarring if your learning style for all, all of your educational career has been memorization and reading for rote recall. And then suddenly you're in a situation where that is not valued. And not only is that not valued, but there's an expectation of reading critically for application and synthesis in a way that you didn't used to learn. And, you know, it can just be so surprising and embarrassing, you know, that students can feel cut off and, and less likely to seek out help. And then miscommunication can increase as well with perceptions of cultural difference, meaning that then trying to help the student or address the issue, actually miscommunication can exacerbate. But then also there have been some, uh, of course, I want to mention positive impacts of cultural difference. Um, and in a study that we're going to look at next, Students at an online university, uh, students in an online MBA program, sorry, students from China, Russia, and India, uh, found actually that asynchronous classroom um, mitigated miscommunication issues, actually made communication smoother because in their experience when they had been in classrooms where um, they were synchronous face to face, they had a difficult time understanding uh, their colleagues and their teachers' accents. And so having written communication actually was preferred for some, uh, for students in that study. So, you know, there are ways that the online uh, classroom can help uh, assuage communication issues that maybe we wouldn't have thought of. And now we're going to move into the second part of the presentation here. I'm going to talk about some students' perceptions of cultural differences, some strategies that you can incorporate, you might consider incorporating into your teaching and we'll talk about teaching philosophy too to round out the session. Um, I do want to encourage you if you have any uh, questions or comments, if you agree or disagree, if there's any kind of discussion you'd like to have, please do um, feel free. Go ahead and avail yourself in the chat box. It'd be great to uh, keep our conversation going. All right, so um, this study I was mentioning of students in an online MBA program, their perceptions of cultural differences uh, in, in this um, program. Uh, they identified some issues that they perceived as affecting their learning, and then the researchers suggested potential solutions 
that might um, that instructors might put into play if they find that this is happening in their classrooms. And so students um, had a hard time in this case with application-based assessments um, because uh, they had been assessed on their learning in different ways in their cultures, um, in their previous educational experiences. And so then the um, recommendation would be to use multiple kinds of assessment. So maybe there is an opportunity for students to write a paper that is a summary um, of a chapter that they, an article that they read, or, or that um, asks for something in terms of, you know, recall uh, versus synthesizing it or um, applying it into a different context. Not every paper, but perhaps some, you know, one or a discussion post, something like that. Students felt like there was um, information overload in their online course. You know, everything is written and it's in so many different places, and it became difficult. Um, particularly in discussion threads, to try to piece out which items in the discussion thread were most important. You know, um, the one of the comments in this study was that the instructor commented on so many different students' posts and said positive things about so many different students' posts that when um, this student at the end of the week tried to go back through the post to pull out the main ideas, that person was overwhelmed and couldn't quite tell what the main ideas were because that person was taking his or her cue from the instructor in the classroom. And, and you know, in that person's experience, the instructor would say, here's what you need to know. And that didn't happen here. You know, in this case, you know, students draw from the discussion the main ideas that, that they take. That the instructor doesn't always go back over it. And the recommendation was, you know, go ahead and go back through that discussion thread and you could identify at the end of the week or at the end of a given topic some of the key points for students, kind of summarize them in a post at the end. Um, I mentioned asynchronous communication can be clearer for students, but time zones are disruptive. The recommendation was to set some live chat sessions so that students could participate in real time talking to their instructor. And I know that can be challenging too across time zones as well. Um, so these are just suggestions that you might implement here and there on occasion, but certainly we wouldn't expect all of them to end up in your next class necessarily. Um, the students said that in something that affected their learning in this classroom was that the examples were all U.S. focused. And they're in an MBA program and they had hoped for, you know, case studies or something based in another country, you know, and which then would you know, you wouldn't just change the name United States to China. You know, it would have more implications than that. And so the recommendation was, you know, ask students to share examples relevant in other countries or provide some, you know, go ahead and, and seek some out and incorporate them into the classroom. And I'll go through a couple more of these before we leave the slide and then I'll come to the chat box. Students noticed that reading, you know, reading takes three times as long, they felt, um, in English versus their own language, you know, having to go back and translate. Um, and one way the researchers suggested addressing that was to try to urge students to start early and to be available to answer questions um, before that reading is due, if the students have started it ahead of time to accommodate that extra time, or after the reading is due, you know, if student says, you know, I went back, I'm still reading that from last week or the week before and I had some questions and going ahead and answering that even though the curriculum has moved forward on the syllabus. And finally, that severe first penalty or penalty for first use of incorrect citation formatting, of course, um, being able to turn that incident, incident into a teaching moment. Um, and here at Walden, I included a couple of links in the slide to our academic integrity course and to citation resources in the Writing Center. Let's see. Um, and that Deborah, yep, um, makes perfect sense that international students would feel more comfortable in an asynchronous environment. And you're welcome for that validation, sure. And uh, that came from the research, not from me, but when I read it, I thought, oh, that makes sense. You know, that makes sense too. Um, often I'll focus in an online classroom on the differences in writing. And, and, you know, I'll interpret them as challenging because maybe students' writing skills aren't all on an equal playing field, right? But here students are saying, no, 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 this is great. It's so much better than trying to figure out people's accents. Uh, and I had never thought of that perspective till I was researching for this um, presentation. So it was great to, to read. And Tammy, let's see. In some cultures, individual identity is secondary to group identity. And that is what, it, this is probably drawing on one of the frames that Emily was mentioning earlier. And if I'm missing that, I'm, I'm, if it's in the context of this slide, if you want to type a little bit more, I'll be happy to address it. 
But, um, but if that is about the framework, um, yes, individual identity can be secondary um, to group identity. That's a great point. And so there are um, some concrete ways that you could go about supporting international students' learning. And this builds on a couple of the um, suggestions that the researchers gave on the previous slide. In particular, the idea that maybe at the end of a long discussion thread, you could cull out a few main ideas and present them to students. And I know some faculty will say, well, that's the, what I want the students to learn how to do. And I totally agree with that. But actually, it can be super helpful if you do it for them as a model. And you even explain that. You know, there are many ideas in this discussion thread. And I'm going to pull out the, the ones that I see as important or key takeaways. Here's why they're key takeaways. And in future discussion threads, you know, you should use these sorts of questions to guide the information that you draw out as well from future threads. Um, so it, it could be actually a really useful exercise for international students and for all students in the classroom, especially one early on in their Walden programs. Um, if you did that, you know, if it's an eight-week class or an 11-week class and you did that, you know, twice, three times, you know, it, students could really begin to um, take that lead and model it themselves. Uh, Tammy, I see you followed up. Sometimes the student will shy away from sharing his or her perspective mm -hmm, if it's perceived different from others in the group. Yeah, absolutely. Another way that, that students might um, not want to be identified, you know, that uh, as different. Keep quiet there. And I see Emily typing as well. So thinking in terms of supporting student learning, go ahead and be explicit. You might ask yourself, what does a student need to do to succeed in this course? Now, this is different from the question earlier, what do I need to do to get an A? <laughs> I don't want that, you know, that's not the spirit behind this question. But really thinking literally what does the student need to do to succeed. If you're thinking about being explicit in terms of um, helping students, international students sort of um, navigate differences in teaching and learning styles in the classroom, um, you could go ahead and be explicit and say to students, I expect you to go ahead and ask me questions if you don't understand. And this gets to the point that Tammy just made. You know, sometimes a student won't understand something but doesn't want to be perceived as the one who doesn't get it. You know, and all students, I think, could benefit from that, especially early in their program. So yes, I encourage conversation. And I do you know, expect you to ask these questions. Um, and then if you value differences in student experience, you can go ahead and mention that too. So students don't feel like they all do have to sort of agree with each other, um, that it's OK to be different. Give that validation. Uh, you can point out important dates on the course calendar. You know, I know the calendar is there, and over time you want students to build up to, um, you want students to be able to draw those important dates themselves. Um, but again, this modeling could be really useful. And finally, if, uh, be aware of time zones. Sometimes I know I can forget in the classroom if you give students, for some reason, short notice to apply or to reply to something. If you post a discussion question, you say, oh, this just came up and, you know, we're going to talk about it tomorrow, and can you please reply, you know, within 24 hours or something like that. You know, when you posted it, some people might have just gone to bed and they lose, you know, over time. They, they wouldn't, weren't expecting to be in the classroom at that time. Or, um, but I'm sure you're all aware of, of that sort of um, giving that sort of leeway to students. Oh, great. And Christine, I have a conference call with students at the beginning of a course to review expectations and re encourage them to reach out for help. That's fantastic. That's really great. And to be able to reiterate that, you know, um, over time, I know students can, the more, you know how it is with, with teaching, right? The more times you say it, redundancy works. It, well, we hope it works. The more times you say it and the more different venues over time, they hear it at the beginning, they're reminded in the third week, you know, it can really be helpful. So that's great. Um, some other ways that you could support international students learning, um, I was mentioning, go ahead and provide examples of good practice, such as culling ideas from the discussion thread, um, but also in terms of writing a discussion post or replying to a post uh, that another student has written. I've provided links to two resources in the Walden Writing Center uh, with some examples of what makes a good uh, discussion post and a less successful, a bad discussion post. And this, this one is so hard for me, right? Avoid idioms, figurative language, jokes. You know, it's hard because you want to be personable and, you know, and you want to have a, potentially you want to have a certain, you know, maybe sometimes you do want to be informal. And of course, you can't avoid necessarily idioms and jokes 
every single time in an asynchronous online classroom where all the communication is written, you know, sometimes you do fall into jokes, but maybe it'd be helpful if you, you know, use an idiom or a joke to say, you know, if anybody has questions, you know, about what that means, email me, or you could go ahead and define the idiom, something like that. Um, if you have uh, many students who, who maybe have asked you earlier, you know, oh, I, I'm not sure what that means. It, idioms are so prevalent uh, in our conversation, it's hard to avoid them, you know, even to be conscious of them for native speakers. Uh, so that can be really helpful for students to do that. Great, nice chat going in there, that's fantastic. Thank you, Emily. There's a link to a common American idiom information on the e-guide, on the Walden e-guide. Thanks for including that. Here was another idea that I had never considered, but I really liked it when I read about it. One resource, one study recommended setting a short participation learning curve for students. So rather than have them, you know, sometimes certainly in participation, you earn points by participating in a lot of classes. Um, but maybe in those first couple weeks, you know, especially if a student is in one of their early courses here at Walden, might find it challenging, you know, uh, might like jump into a conversation and it takes so much longer for a student, um, for a given student to read through the thread that maybe the thread has ended by the time the student jumps in. Um, and maybe it's not a matter of, you know, I don't mean if a student just hasn't been coming to class and then shows up on Monday morning and posts a bunch of posts for last week in an effort to get some points. Not that, you know. Um, but if there might be other reasons behind a student not participating early on in the course, maybe have a week or two where students don't yet earn or lose points before you move into the rest of the class. And I know that can be hard because in our online classes, the points are already set. So maybe everybody gets 10 points for the first week. You know what I mean? And, and you frame that not as a bonus, but as I want you to, I was going to say get your feet wet, but it's an idiom. See? <laughs> I want you to um, become accustomed to how to participate in this class. Here are my expectations. This week I want you to practice it and next week we'll test it, you know, you'll be scored on participation. And, and that sort of lower risk opportunity to take part in the class at the beginning could really help students um, open up, you know, and, um, and feel as though they can approach you maybe with other concerns, right, that, that maybe you're understanding in a certain way uh, and they, they could appreciate that. Um, you could tell students, you know, uh, provide examples of good practice can also be telling students to read from main points, not for memorization or recall. Some students might just um, take a chapter of a book and just read every word and assume that every word is important and I need to commit all of these words to memory or I have to remember everything about this chapter because that is what I will be tested on, which is not the case, certainly. Um, and so, you know, you could uh, provide that. Uh, instruction for them, you know, read for the main points and draw out the main ideas. I'm not going to ask you, you're not responsible for knowing every single thing because you won't be tested on it for recall. And of course that's as appropriate according to your class. And you could, re I would recommend referring students to evaluation rubric before the due date. Of course, I know that already happens in our online classrooms in the assignment section. It even says here's the rubric. Um, but it can help to be explicit about that, you know, perhaps the day a paper is due or before, you know, a couple days before it's due. And don't forget to read the rubric. I know I do that in my classes all the time, regardless of um, whether or not uh, there have been cultural um, differences, you know, whether or not any students have, have approached me and had questions uh, or having a hard time navigating the content. And Tammy, the English language contains so many idioms. Wow. So ESL courses on idioms all on their own are eight weeks long. It's challenging even in, uh, for native speakers in business writing, you know, business and professional writing. Um, one of the tenets uh, of some business writing books is don't write in idioms in your emails and your sales letters, you know, unless you're looking for a certain kind of tone or, or marketing approach. You know, when you're trying to be formal, avoid them. And that's it's hard to do. Uh, so um, shifting gears here a little bit. So we've discussed frames of cultural reference, as well as a study with international students' perceptions of cultural difference in online learning, how uh, what they perceive as different affected their learning. We talked about some strategies you might incorporate into your teaching to help students succeed. And so now here towards the end of the session, we can shift our focus out to a, a broader topic in teaching philosophy. And so 
teaching a philosophy um, is an articulation, a statement of your beliefs, values, attitudes about teaching and learning. And then um, a description with examples of how your beliefs, values, attitudes in the, um, are put into action in the classroom. Um, and you can think about beliefs, values, and attitudes, you know, beliefs, uh, ideas that you hold to be true, right? Your, your own culture, maybe your faith, and you know, these, these core fundamental beliefs. Uh, values being what is important to you, family, and communica communication, being student-centered. Um, what do you value in ethics, certainly, uh, being ethical and acting in, with integrity? And then what are some of your attitudes? Attitudes towards teaching, how you treat others and approach situations, you know, formal, informal, uh, how you uh, expect others to treat you, and how you respond in, in crisis situations or, you know, in everyday conversation situations, you know, beliefs, values, and attitudes. Thinking about how they play out in your teaching, you know, what examples do you have that demonstrate your teaching philosophy in action? And I know one of the real values of even of reflecting on your teaching philosophy, if not going through the exercise of writing it down. I think one of the real values of it is that it gives you the opportunity, particularly if you're not at the beginning of your career, but you've been teaching for some time. It gives you the opportunity to sort of realign what you do in the classroom with what you think is your teaching philosophy, right? You know, it might be like, well, this is how I would describe my teaching philosophy. This is how I would articulate it in a paragraph. And then when you go for examples, you know, sometimes you do find examples of that, but sometimes, you know, teaching happens so fast every day. We are not necessarily self-aware and thinking thoughtfully and in an informed way about every single interaction, right, with a student. Sometimes things happen so fast. And in those examples, how would you describe your philosophy there? You know, does it align with what you feel your overall philosophy is? And plenty of times it does, but plenty of times over time in a career, it can sort of go, they can diverge your actions in the classroom versus your beliefs, attitudes, and values. And reflecting on them can really help you bring them back together. It can be very rewarding. Uh, teaching philosophies, uh, there is a book out just this year that looks great. I, I, I haven't looked at it, I think it's just recently out and I have it in the references on teaching across cultures, and it, it just um, has a lot of really practical, interesting uh, information, great examples, and this comes from it, um, Chavez and Longerbean uh, from this year. So here are a couple of philosophies that they put forth, right? On the one hand, there are faculty who teach from the position, from the belief, that faculty are responsible for student learning and success that they engage students and try alternative approaches until something works, getting through to that student at some point. And there's another philosophy of teaching, the belief, faculty who teach from the belief that faculty are responsible for weeding out bad students from the good, essentially kind of a gatekeeping philosophy, that students are responsible for their own success and their own learning, and that students need to adapt to a given learning environment and situation or else move on. And uh, these are both uh, philosophies that are in practice today, and people have good reasons for, you know, um, seeing either of them as valuable. And it get me to thinking when I saw these two philosophies paired together like this in that book, it got me to thinking about uh, Walden's philosophy, right? We, we, have, we have heard, articulated pretty regularly here at Walden, the overarching teaching philosophy, and I'd also say instructional support philosophy for those of us who are in uh, academic support centers, but we don't teach in the classroom per se. We've heard that philosophy of we meet students where they are. That is, um, that is what we hear, you know, when I go to national faculty meetings on behalf of the Academic Skills Center, and um, we'll hear that from our chief academic officer, right, um, Eric Rydell, or from the president. Um, John Kaplan, or, or from fellow faculty, you know, we meet students where they are. And I look at these two teaching philosophies, you know, and I think, well, which one, with which one do we meet students where we are, right? And, and it strikes me that that would be the first one. You know, you meet students where they are and you help them along. 
but then I know, I know I have a mindset sometimes of, you know, weeding out bad students from the good. I try not to <laughs> articulate it that way, but if I'm going to be honest with myself, you know, I, I do think that way in some instances. And so it's interesting to think about reconciling, you know, how do I, how do I merge those two? I want to meet students where they are. And sometimes that involves, you know, teaching as, as much as you can, helping a student, but maybe you don't find an approach. I don't find an approach until something works. Maybe something hasn't worked. You know what I mean? And, and there are some faculty who will not rest and keep going to find something that works. And then there are other faculty, or I shouldn't say faculty, but people in different contexts or situations who might say, okay, well, you know, um, I, now it's time for you to begin drawing your own ideas from the discussion thread or finding the important dates in the calendar yourself. You know, I can't keep doing this sort of thing for you. And that's legitimate. Um, it's really fascinating, I think, um, to think about teaching philosophies like these in the context of one that we hear walled and wide and how that affects the ways we teach. So I just want to raise these ideas. If anybody has anything they want to speak to this idea, we can. I think there's already great conversation going on in the chat. It's fantastic, so definitely keep that going. I'll go to the next slide, but if anybody wants to um, talk about these to uh, philosophies or ideas, uh, definitely do. We can always stop and go back. Okay, so what are ways that you might reflect on your teaching philosophy, you might reimagine it um, in the context of cultural differences? One, some of the strategies, these um, are strategies from a few different resources, not just the book I was mentioning on the previous slide. Um, and multiple sources recommend self-reflecting culturally. You know, think about um, how you can reflect on ways that you do um, already create a culturally inclusive classroom, maybe without even knowing it. And then um, what are some other ways as well, more explicit ways that you could do so um, to deepen that sense of cultural inclusion. And so I've linked here some resources to each one of these um, approaches to reimagining your teaching philosophy. Um, develop cu cultural competence, and this this source I couldn't resist because it came from APA, you know. <laughs> and so um, self-reflection, uh, activities for self-reflection from APA. And then um, exploring aspects of teaching across cultures, and this comes from Carnegie Mellon, this culture shock, cultural intelligence, and teaching approaches. It's a pretty cool online guide, and it also has a link to a PDF booklet uh, that is pretty good, too, um, and I mentioned that at Carnegie Mellon. So these resources are really interesting. As I said, we're just scratching the surface of this topic. So many of these resources, you can really dig deep, you know, to the extent that you want to and, and think about ways that you might re-envision your attitudes and beliefs and, and, and values of teaching um, or even just reflect on them. Yes, oh, and so there was... Um, comment, when memorization is the emphasis starting in kindergarten and a student arrives at an undergraduate or graduate program that emphasizes critical thinking and argumentation, absolutely, it is an invisible wall that takes time and patience. You have to be able to learn. Imagine if you were learning for the first time, you know, taking on that learning style for the first time, and particularly in an asynchronous online classroom in another country. Right, and so your time zone, like it, it, there's so many challenges already, um, potentially, in the in that format, and now you are learning a completely different style, of, a completely different learning style in a classroom that chances are operates under a completely different teaching style than what you have been used to for all that time. It, it, it is, a, it can be such a jarring experience, and of course, any of us could put ourselves in the position of learning another language and then, you know, getting some facility with that language and then going on for an advanced degree or even a, a college degree, something in higher education, where then we take a class, you know, in a, an online classroom from um, uh, in a country that we don't speak that language and, and we don't know what the teaching culture is there. We weren't raised in that educational culture. So it can be really shocking. Emily, thanks for sharing the URL on the PowerPoint on our website. That's great. Uh, and so finally, I have a few resources here for revising a teaching philosophy. Um, so you've been sort of reflecting on uh, teaching across cultures and cultural inclusion. And these are um, ways that you might think about writing and revising your, your teaching philosophy statement if you went to the, to the point of actually um, wanting to write it out. 
Uh, there are tips from the University of Michigan Center for Research on Learning and Teaching, from Minnesota's Center for Educational Innovation. Um, and either way, whether or not you were to decide to write out the statement or not, um, which I do think is a great exercise, especially if you do it with a cohort, you know, with colleagues in your college or in your program, and you share them and you get feedback and you read other people's. Um, it, can, it can be a really great um, opportunity to, to think about how other people teach and how that could affect you teach, your teaching as well. Uh, but I would recommend um, Stephen Brookfield's book up at the top there, uh, Becoming a Critically Reflective Teacher. That is a classic um, in the field. And uh, you might know about it already, and, but even if you don't want, if you don't choose to write out the whole statement, you can go ahead and uh, take advantage of the activities, the self-reflection activities in that book. These are the references if you want to get out your magnifying glass and look them over sometime. <laughs> um, but you'll find everything I mentioned uh, that we cited uh, is, is in here, um, including that book uh, from this year. It's called Teaching Across Cultural Strengths, A Guide to Balancing Integrated and Individuated Cultural Frameworks in College Teaching.